these. They were out there surfing the web for jihadist websites. In God's name, what are you people doing? How didn't you know this? Well, the reason we didn't know this is that we do not look at the web activity of American citizens or legal permanent residents in the United States. This isn't this open-ended activity that's been suggested up here. This is actually very narrow, and the National Security Agency and other elements of the security structure actually have chosen not to do things for your privacy that unarguably would actually make you a bit safer. May I ask the general question? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does the head of the NSA have the constitutional legal authority to move the line between privacy and, and surveillance? There's a clue how they would like you to answer. The plebiscite gone it's on a, here. It's a trick question because I know how he answered it uh, last month at a law school. At Washington Elite. Yes. All right. You want the rest of the story? Yes. All right. This may be a two-act play. All right. Uh, but I'll give you the executive summary. I'll be efficient. What I did the afternoon of 9-11 had to do with something called minimization. You know, the accusations fit on a bumper sticker. The reality takes a little longer, and I'm sorry, but minimization is what NSA does when it inadvertently, incidentally, incidentally, collects information about you. I mean, the NSA could be targeting a, a, a foreigner. That foreigner talks to you. NSA is still targeting the foreigner. In the routine conduct of its business, it gathers information to, from, or about what we call protected persons, which is actually a bigger group than US citizens. Right? When NSA does that, NSA is required to suppress, required to suppress the US identity. So in other words, foreign terrorist Abu Ahmed bin bad guy was talking to a known US person, we won't say the judge, just a known U.S. person. And we minimize the U.S. identity to protect your privacy unless, of course, the identity of the U.S. person is absolutely essential to the intelligence value of the intercept in the first place. And so I've got a bad guy talking to that phone number in the Bronx and says, brother, the attack tomorrow is at noon. I think the US person identity is pretty important to the intelligence value of that report. So that on the afternoon of September 11, 2001, with 3,000 of my countrymen dead and smoking holes in two cities and in countryside in my native western Pennsylvania, I told the NSA analysts when they were making the judgment based upon the reasonableness standard of the Fourth Amendment, when they were making the judgment as to whether or not the U.S. identity for calls from Afghanistan, whether or not the U.S. identity was essential to understanding the intelligence value, they should use a different standard than they used at 8 o'clock that morning. That's the line I moved, Judge. You asked. Somehow, I didn't hear you use the word constitution. So then, that document so then to told, which you swore an oath of fidelity. So then I told George Tenet what I was doing, and George told the president and vice president, and then I called up the chair and ranking members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees and told them what I was doing. I offered to come down to explain it to them in detail. The Senate said, fine, you're cool. The House said, come on down, and I did, and explained it in detail to our oversight bodies. By the way, talking about oversight and secret law and so on, you know the strongest defenders of what NSA has been doing have been the chair and ranking of the two oversight committees, have been the chair and ranking of the people most knowledgeable, most responsible for what they do. We talk about Ron Wyden, who has certainly opposition to all of these programs. The reason Senator Wyden has been so public is that, and again, you may agree with him and not me, but in the committee, which knew fully of these programs, he consistently lost the vote 13 to 2. 
I, if I may, I'd like to go to the, in the short time we have available here. I'd like to go to what I think is implicit in this discussion, and that is a lack of trust in our government on the part of the American people. Uh, I would like to go further and say to you, I believe personally that that lack of trust is one of the healthiest aspects of our society today. That skepticism, that challenge, and that insistence uh, in, again, in my judgment, on a strict interpretation of the Constitution uh, will, I think, help to preserve, God willing, this constitutional republic. I think it is also important that we understand that that trust, you mentioned the heads and ranking members of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. Well, in my view, and I would ask you both to give us your assessment, they have not provided vigorous and broad intelligence oversight. There is not that perception. Congress has one of the lowest approval ratings in, in history right now. Uh, the President of the United States, the same may be said of him. The openness and transparency has certainly not devolved from this presidency. Uh, we know that there are great and good public servants like General Hayden. But we need far more in the way of assurances that that Constitution is being observed that we share national values and the national interest. And I truly believe the American people right now have profound, persistent doubts about that reality. Uh, can I comment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Lou's absolutely right. And one of the challenges that people like me have had is that this discussion is taking place in a perfect storm of both governmental and executive overreach. Right. And so how, how well or, or often I might argue the appropriateness of this, I know it's happening in a broader context of, of the IRS, and um, I've got a pen and a phone, uh, and we can't wait, and the president deciding whether or not the Senate was or was not in session for recess appointments, I, it poisons this entire discussion. And, and that's why I, I go out of my way to say, but let's talk about the specifics on this one. So but, that we can make that judgment. But what also poisons all of this is the lack of accountability and lack of transparency because of passion for secrecy with which the government has argued. You see, what the general did not tell you is when he goes to these committee members and reveals what they're doing and the committee members say yes, the committee members are sworn to secrecy and cannot tell their fellow members of the House and cannot tell their fellow members of the Senate and cannot tell the voters who sent them there. So the government has intentionally created a secret deep government, if you will, and sworn everybody in there to secrecy, including the judges who have been complicit in this. The essence of democracy, the essence of democracy and freedom is that the government works for us. We don't work for it. And so we have to know what it is doing. So the judge brings up an, an incredibly important point, and, and, and he and I probably agree that my old community needs to be more, more transparent. All right? But, but let's be real about this, OK? You don't conduct espionage by plebiscite. Espionage is an activity that succeeds only because of secrecy. Now, the grand compromise, the grand compromise, and by the way, we're still the only Western democracy that does what I'm going to describe for you now. The grand compromise of the mid to late 1970s is that something, espionage, which previously was the province only of the executive, will now have oversight from the other branches of government. Out of the 70s come the oversight committees, by the way, which don't exist in other democracies. We have the House and the Senate oversight committees. I am legally and morally responsible to keep them fully and currently informed of what it is we're doing. And then, and no one else does this, we brought the court in. Now, I understand it's the FISA court. And the judge says the FISA court is weird because it's secret. I'm telling you it's weird because it exists. No other Western democracy goes to a court to conduct espionage. And so when we're looking at this from NSA, with the balance between secrecy needed for success and transparency needed for approval, we're saying this was authorized by the president, legislated by Congress, overseen by the court. I'm sorry, folks, that is the Madisonian trifecta. Thank you. Thank you.
I want to say thank you, first of all, and what a pleasure and uh, honor it is to be with Judge Napolitano. Uh, General Hayden, great to be with you. Thanks. It's an honor. Uh, and I would say, if I may, General Hayden, so long as we have uh, men like yourselves and the judge contesting big issues and big ideas and talking about this nation's interest and our great Constitution, uh, all, all men and women who appear here will be playing, uh, bef playing at home before CPAC. Thanks so much. Thank you, John.